Frederick Douglass is my uh, favorite uh, American. And uh, I started reading about him when I was fifth, in fifth grade at the George S. Payne School down the street. And, uh, and then as I uh, went to uh, junior high, East Junior High, then the Brockton High, then to DC, uh, I majored. I was the first graduate at Boston College with a sociology African history major since the school's inception in 1863. And so my background was African American history, my specialty. And Frederick Douglass has always been um, the person for me. Um, and so uh, that's why I'm here next week. Uh, Dr. Highlander from Stonehill, he was uh, the last time he was at Stonehill, I remember, um, will be here. And so it, was, it wasn't it was convenient, but uh, I said I have to do a presentation on it because I won't be here for the 250th or the 300th. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so The connection, my presentation is going to be a little different, uh, a, lot, a lot different from, um, from Gary's in that I'm going to kind of talk about uh, the local history of Brockton, the abolitionist uh, movement here in Brockton, and, uh, and how uh, Frederick Douglass got involved, and then our own radical uh, abolitionist, Edward Eels Bennett. And, uh, and, so, and so what I want to do is I'm going to, uh, oh good, we're, we're up and running. <laughs> uh, so what I, it's, it's not going to be chronological, I'm going to mention, uh, I like questions and answers, and uh, we're going to end the presentation with a, uh, a trip to the foyer where we have a nice picture of Edward Eels Bennett, and uh, actually a slice from the, uh, the sycamore tree, which was the Liberty Tree. This first slide that I have is of the, uh, the, the meeting house in, um, in, in, on Nantucket Island. And my wife and I were able to, uh, to go there a few summers ago. And, uh, and so what happened is Frederick Douglass's uh, first presentation, his, his first speech to uh, a majority white audience was on Nantucket in 1841. And, uh, and, and this was, he was invited uh, by Mr. Coffin, who was an abolitionist, and, uh, and uh, he had already met Mr. Garrison, and he had already met uh, Mr. Collins, and what happened was there's always a, uh, there's a, a black community that Derek Sturman, Nantucket, was called Guinea. Uh, and so he stayed, Frederick stayed at their church, a Baptist church, and, uh, and he spoke, and uh, the uh, the reception, there was a reporter, and the, it was, by all accounts, uh, quite outstanding. So this is this is after this presentation, at the end of the presentation, uh, Mr. Uh, Garrison had said, did we, did we not hear from a man, is this, is this a man, or is this a, a piece of chat? <coughs> and so, that's when they said we've got to have him in our employ, and uh, and that was his beginning. Now, before this, we have a situation where my my goal tonight is for you to just have um, an interest in his life, and uh, for you to kind of read some of the uh, his books on your own. Now, there are, there are four books. Most people are familiar with this, which is the narrative. Uh, this is the book that he wrote in 1845. Uh, he was living in Lynn at the time. And his second book in 1855 is uh, My Bondage, My Freedom. And then later on, uh, the third book is The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. So the idea is, you know, I think you're gonna, he, he was such uh, a tremendous fellow. Uh, I, I, I want to say, I think of him in terms of, like I think of Thomas Jefferson in terms of being a renaissance man of sorts. But uh, what, what I want to do is first take you back. Now, he left, he was staying in New Bedford at this time when they were asked, uh, he was asked to speak in Nantucket. So I'm going to take you back to his birth. Uh, and the narrative, the, the difference between the, the three books, 
this is the first, and it's and it's very um, it appears it appeals to one on the the hot level, the gut level, and and you can see his development ten years later when he does this. He had uh, met with uh, Eric Beecher Stowe at Andover uh, about a year after she had uh, completed Uncle Tom's Cabin. They had talked. And then he, he did My Bondage, and which is more, you can see the, little, the literary style developing. And then the third book, you know, again, so you can see his development as a writer, but here, uh, it's just, it's just, uh, it's very passionate, it's more passionate. And I think there's less passion in the others, but there are other aspects that make it interesting. But uh, one of the things that, uh, that and, and this was the first book I read, and I think I, uh, in high school, in fifth grade, I read something, picture book, and then uh, when I got to high school, it, it was very, 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 uh, very, very powerful. Uh, and so he takes, he's born in Maryland, um, he uh, attempts to run away, and he's actually caught, it's thwarted, he's brought back, and his uh, master doesn't, they always threaten the slaves because if you were a slave in Maryland or Delaware, the threat was if you did something, we'll, sit, we'll sell you south. So no one, none of the slaves knew it was worse in Louisiana, Georgia, uh, Mississippi. So the idea of, of not going that far south, because the slaves are already, that's the worst that could happen to you. So what his master did was he sent him to a, what was, called a, 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 an overseer who was a slave breaker. So in other words, it's the idea to break the spirit so he won't run away again. And he went to this, uh, this slave breaker, Mr. Covey. And Mr. Covey was known in the area, out, give me your, your most uh, uh, angriest, violent slave, and I'll break it, and, uh, and, and for a fee. So he, the slave would work on Mr. Covey's uh, plantation and then after a, a number of months or years would be returned. And what happened was he and Mr. Covey had an encounter and, uh, and they actually fought. And, and instead, Mr. Covey, instead of normally what would have happened is uh, Frederick Douglass either would have been flogged or, or sent south. But Mr. Covey had such a, a reputation of breaking <laughs> slaves that he didn't want to admit that he was wrong. He never ever touched uh, Frederick again. And so he's so fortunate that he, he, did, he survived that. And, and, uh, and so then he, he went to an, uh, his, uh, another relative, another master, it's all detailed. It's very, it's only 125 pages, wonderful reading. But the upshot is uh, he, he then went to Baltimore to another relative of his uh, master, and he's working there, and he's working, his, his master said, well, you know, you ran away, so we really gotta watch you. So he's only working for, uh, he's working, and he's getting money, and he's turning some of that money over to his master. So, you know, he's, uh, you know, basically, he's being rented out, which was a system that they used because in Baltimore, there were free blacks as well as slaves, and they could actually get the money. So this is the situation. Now, in this in this capacity, he learns hawking. So he's he, a ship hawker, and and he's he's saving money. He's putting money away. He's giving money to his master, but he's also keeping money for himself. Speaking English. Excuse me. Speaking English. Yeah, he's speaking English. Yeah. And oh, and at any time, please, if there's a question, please raise your hand. So. So at this time, he, he hatches a plan, and um, he's, he's, meantime, he's met this, uh, this woman who's, uh, she, her name is Anna Murray. She's a uh, uh, free black, and they're dating. She's saved money, and they actually use this, uh, some of these funds, to help him run away. She's a domestic. And so, uh, so that's the background in terms of his running, getting away, he actually, um, he, he, he dresses himself as a uh, seaman and he takes uh, three boats, four trains, and basically he, he escapes to, uh, uh, he lands in New Bedford. 
And uh, the following day, um, they had already arranged this. Anna Murray, who was a free woman, but she needs, she still needed passes and so forth. And, and she was illiterate all her life. And, uh, and then she joined him in New York City. And then from New York City, uh, they went to Newport. Uh, and again, a series of, a series of trains in, in steamships. And then they end up in, in New Bedford. New Bedford at the time had the largest black population in New England, larger than Boston. And it was a very wealthy, because of the whale oil industry and so forth, a very wealthy and a lot of Quakers. So this was that whole group in terms of his support. Uh, next slide. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, how did he become a little bit? Uh, he had uh, he, his uh, mistress in Baltimore, uh, Mrs. All, uh, actually taught him initially. And then her husband said, you know, uh, he told her to stop. And, uh, and she said that, um, you know, he said, if you, if this is his, these are his words, if you, if you teach the nigga to, uh, to read and write, you know, you give him an L, they'll take him out. You know, so this was when he was younger? This is when he was younger. Okay. And so, but what he did was he created games with a lot of the boys in Baltimore. And he, uh, so he would read more and he would use their books. And uh, in fact, the young, uh, I think it's young Tommy uh, that he looked after in Baltimore, he would look at his books. And so he literally taught himself to read. And the, the book that uh, made a great impact uh, on him was the, uh, the, what we call the Columbia Orator. It was uh, a book published in 1797 by a, uh, an English schoolmaster here in Boston. And, uh, and so that was one of his favorite books. But good question. Anything else? Yes. Is Lynn here in Bedford? Uh, Lynn is, uh, we're going to talk about that in a little while. Lynn is north of Boston, south of Salem. Okay. So he, he actually, when he leaves New Bedford, he goes to Lynn. And, uh, and then from Lynn, he goes to Rochester, New York. From Rochester, New York, he then moves to Cedar Hill in Washington, D.C. That's eight months. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, next one. I think there's no way to do it. I'll just say it. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and here, now, there's a, an, an exhibit currently in Boston. It's, it's going to, it's been extended three times. This third time, it's, uh, it's now going to uh, run until December of uh, 2018. And he is, he is said to be, Frederick Douglass is said to be the most photographed band in the 19th century. And the exhibit is outstanding. And uh, if you get a chance, it's at the Museum of African American History on, uh, on Beacon Hill, and, it, and it's a must. It gives you uh, just all of the different, he was enamored with photography, the daguerreotype, and so it wasn't by accident. And he loved to dress, uh, the cravat and so forth, even before his time in, uh, in Europe. Uh, next one. Okay, this is the cover page of a piece of sheet music. And um, could we darken the lights a little bit? This was, uh, this was published in Boston on Court Street. And the reason why I like this is because of the, uh, the detail uh, showing you there was uh, music about the runaway slave and so forth. And it just gives you, it's the, uh, uh, an idea of, of what he tried to, what he wrote down, but a, a fanciful version in terms of committing it to music. Next one. Now, if Frederick Douglass was here today, this is why my presentation is a little different. Um, you know, one of the things he would say is, it wasn't just me. You know, history tends to think about him, and it wasn't, and it wasn't just him. And this is a picture of his wife, um, Anne, Anna Marie. And I said she was a free woman in Baltimore. She had saved money. They had merged his money he had made from caulking, the money that he did not give his, uh, his master. And uh, they both escaped. He first, and then she joined him later. 
she never, uh, she was illiterate all her life. So even though they had tutors and so forth, she never became literate. So there was always a little distance in terms of his work and her staying home with the children. But one of the things that, uh, that historians don't talk about is the fact that uh, she ran a household, they had five children. She actually, in the, the Lynn years, she actually uh, uh, put shoes together, attached the uppers to the lowers, uh, because there was no discrimination that you could do that kind of work in your home. Then you went and sold the shoes. So, uh, but she, uh, she was a, a, a really powerful woman and even though illiterate, was really um, the solid, uh, the solid base in terms of the family. Next one, and uh, you'll see other pictures of him in, in different books. But this is one later on in his next. And this is his older daughter Rosetta. So uh, Rosetta was born um, about nine months after they were married. In fact. Uh, they were married in New York by uh, uh, Reverend Pennington, and then uh, they lived in New Bedford, and they lived with a couple, uh, Holly and Nathan Johnson. And the house is on the National Historical Register, so if you go to New Bedford, you'll see there are four buildings attached. One was the meeting house. And uh, after he came to New Bedford, he, he, they, they ran out of money on their way. And um, two uh, uh, Quakers said, uh, well, we'll help you. And when they got to New Bedford, uh, the, the coachman kept their bags. And he went, and, they, and these two Quakers had introduced him to, was already part of the Underground Railroad, so they knew uh, the Johnsons in advance. And the Johnson, Polly and, and Nathan Johnson were African Americans, uh, very uh, involved in the, uh, African, the Underground Railroad in New Bedford. And so what happened was they, uh, as a result, they became good friends. Yeah, and <coughs> oh, we'll, we'll get there. Yep, we'll get there. We're, we're still in New Bedford. We just did the job on Nantucket, uh, and uh, we'll get there. We're still in New Bedford. But the, what happens is Rosetta is born. Rosetta is born in New Bedford. And he is, uh, Frederick Douglass and uh, Anna, they love New Bedford. Uh, he, he's about free for three days. He goes down to the, uh, the, uh, the sea front. <coughs> he applies for a job. Um, the job is a caulker, but he cannot get the job. It's $2 a day. And uh, because the fear is that he had this problem in Baltimore, um, if you, you know, if he is hired, the white clockers will get upset. And, um, and so, you know, the, the, they don't hire him. So he, it's $2 a day, so he takes a lesser job for $1 a day, but he's free. So he's still exhilarated in the whole idea of, of not having to, before he would have to give Master Old some of his money. But he's still, that exhilaration of freedom is still with him. Well, yeah, because that's what I, my question was, what his status was, because he was a runaway slave, mm -hmm. and so when he was up here, how did he become free? Just when you're All right, now, what happens is, this is uh, 1838, and then Rosetta's born in 1839, so the Fugitive Slave Act is not, has not been passed, but he is still considered property, so slave catchers can come and uh, get you and bring you back. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when he gets to uh, he gets to New York, and he and he's by himself when he first arrives, and he sees somebody that he knew in Baltimore, and the person told him he said he said you can't he said I'm telling you now you can't trust me because unfortunately the the white slave masters paid other African Americans as trackers. So you can you if you saw somebody and he and this happened a lot. So he was so nervous. In fact, the first night he was in New York, he was supposed to go to a home and stay. It was part of the arrangement with the Underground Railroad. And he was so fearful after speaking to this gentleman that he stayed outside and and, and, and huddled himself near some barrels uh, at, near the dock because he was afraid after he had told him that somebody might see him. And he might be reported because that also happened on his way leaving Baltimore. You know, he 
because you know people knew who he was uh, from I haven't visited the plantation. Any so, other? Yeah. So he was still considered a slave. He's still considered he's a slave, and, and legally, yeah. legally, if his if master old had sent somebody, they could actually bring him back. So he, at this point, but he's still feeling, well, I'm free. I'm, I, you know, the first thing he, he says, free. I'm in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's what he writes down. He says, Oh, the Commonwealth, that he says, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, so now he's in New Bedford. They had a wonderful. They loved uh, New Bedford. They were at a church, um, he taught Sunday school, um, Anna was involved, she did domestic service. Uh, they loved the life in New Bedford. There were schools, integrated schools, so, you know, um, she was only one, she was just born, but, you know, it, it had a lot of promise. And after that presentation in Nantucket, everything changes. So now, instead of making a dollar a day, if he works for William Lloyd Garrison in the Anti-Slavery Society in Massachusetts, he's going to make more money. So uh, that's what happens. And so they say, let's, we, 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 we're, it's all of New England, and also, uh, you know, we might send you to New York. So the move to Lynn was logistical. So what happens is he moves to Lynn, and, uh, and this is uh, the Lynn years, this was just published uh, this year, the Lynn years 1841 to 1848. And what happens is this book was actually written while he was in Lynn. So, you know, he actually writes Lynn and that's the narrative, he finishes it in Lynn. And what happens is he has, uh, he has an incident in Lynn that kind of is like a, uh, uh, I guess a, a launching point a launching pad for his career. And uh, in fact, one writer, uh, Garfield says it's, it was a, um, it was a uh, Rosetta um, Cox moment. And I just want to read you what happened uh, because it, it comes up in some of the literature and I don't know, I don't know if uh, Gary's going to mention it or not. Um, but essentially he was getting ready to go and uh, he was going to, to uh, meet some others and, and actually do a speaking engagement. And he, uh, there was an incident on the car. Now, the interesting thing is, the other thing I like about him is, this is, uh, he is, this is 1838, 1839, now we're in 1841. So, with, with uh, Frederick Douglass, you can see it, he wrote so much. So, he actually writes in Weymouth, so and so, in Hubbardston, so and so, Grafton, Mass. You know. Uh, so what happens is it's the it's the railroad doesn't come to North Bridgewater until 1846. So he's still in that stage mode. So for example, uh, the Boston Taunton Turnpike. That's how you you know there were no trains, so you got off, you got in Boston, and then you paid a fare, and then you would stop at different taverns. The Brockton Historical Society on, on North Pearl, that was a tavern. So what happened, the horses would be refreshed, you'd have a tank and a veil, some mutton or something, you go on to the next stop. So that's why North Pearl, Pearl, Turnpike Street and Easton, all those, the whole country was like that. You went turnpike to turnpike. So 1846, the railway comes and it changes things. Now, all his speaking engagements are based on transportation. So has to take the train uh, or the stagecoach. And so he encounters some of the discrimination. Um, and this is what he says. He says, you know, and that's why the break with Garrison. The Garrisonians were abolitionists. They were radical abolitionists. Uh, Mr. Garrison was from Newburyport, Mass. But they believed that, that, you know, not only should African Americans be free from slavery, but they should have the same rights as uh, whites. The average abolitionists just believe they should be free from slavery, but they shouldn't have the same rights. And Edward Niels Bennett was what, a radical. So he said, no, not, not only should you have the same, uh, you should be free, but you should have the same rights as we do. So that's the difference. So this, uh, he encountered a lot of the discrimination and what eventually he and Garrison broke. And the reason why they broke is because that, uh, that difference because he 
uh, Douglas felt that it's not, you know, we have to call out the racism, he didn't use that term, but the discrimination in the North, we have to call that out as well. And so black abolitionists and white abolitionists started part, and, um, and, and so that, uh, you know, so I'm going, I'm talking too much, but if you have a question, we'll go on. Let's, let's see some more of the family. Here's what I want you to realize. He did, he's not doing this alone. Next slide. Ask Rosetta. This is Lewis Henry, and uh, the second son. And he was a sergeant major in the 54th uh, Massachusetts Regiment. Next slide. This is Frederick Douglass Jr. Frederick Douglass IV, we had in Brockton on three occasions. Um, at, my, mass, at Messiah Baptist, he came, he and his wife. We had a joint uh, activities with the Brockton Historical Society. Um, and, uh, and he is a descendant from, he's a descendant on Frederick Douglass Jr.'s side. Next one. And this is Charles Ramon, the youngest son. And, uh, and he worked uh, in a campaign in the Mississippi Valley. Now, here's the thing. The 54th Regiment, the 54th and the 55th were the two black regiments established by Governor Andrews here in Massachusetts. People always say, oh, Governor Andrews, that was so great. He had to request permission from President Lincoln who gave it. But it all happened because black abolitionists here were pushing Governor Andrews to do this. He did acquiesce. They were mustered out of a place called Fort Meade, which is in the, uh, there are remnants of the fort actually in the high pocket <coughs> section of uh, Boston. Next one. This is uh, Frederick Douglass and his grandson, um, Joseph. And Frederick Douglass loved classical music, Haydn, Beethoven, he loved playing the violin. And, uh, and so he was very pleased in the later years to have a grandson that also took up the violin. Can you tell us a little about how you get into speaking and how it was all arranged to all these places in the yoga? Right. Well, what happened is, once they moved to Lynn, uh, uh, Mr. Collins, who's an agent, he's now an agent for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. So what they would do is, they would book presentations and engagements. So they would travel to different places uh, in New England and also uh, as far, um, as far west as uh, Indiana. And they would speak on platforms. They would be invited, they would speak at churches. Uh, one time, they failed to let him know uh, that when he spoke in Grafton in 1842, <coughs> they, they failed to let him know that uh, they failed to notify the people in Grafton. So he went to the hotel and took the dinner bell. And he was supposed to speak at 7 o'clock. And starting at 6 o'clock, he went through the town ringing the bell saying, Frederick Douglass will be speaking at Grafton Common. And, uh, and so you, you had to drum up business. And then uh, you were paid by the Anti-Slavery Society. So they gave you a monthly salary. And that's how he sustained himself. But the money, I'm glad you mentioned that, because the money actually wasn't enough. So that's why Anna did other things. And the, and the Ladies' Sewing Society of Lynn, or the Women's Sewing Society of Rochester, wherever they were living, they, they had different functions, and so they would augment the uh, family income that way. Okay, next one. Mr. Trask. <laughs> Mr. Trask, the former student is trying to get your attention. <laughs> uh, Helen Pitts Douglas. So what, what happens is, and I'm kind of, I'm going fast, but you know, that's why I have you here to, you know, ask questions. What happens is, uh, Frederick Douglass makes a great impact. He's growing more popular. Um, after he writes the narrative, because he's named his master and others, he has to leave the country. So what happens is, after they, he writes the book, um, he's living in Lynn, and what happens is they, uh, it's too dangerous because now the slave catchers can come up, they can get him. Um, he's identified where he is, and so he, as a result, he leaves um, and he goes to England. England, Scotland, and Wales uh, for, uh, and Ireland for two years. He, when he leaves, the, the name of the ship is the Cambria, 
and he gets on board the ship, he leaves East Boston, and um, the, the captain of the ship says, I want you to talk about your days when you were enslaved in Maryland. And there are some people on the ship from Georgia, and they are upset, and they make a row, and the captain actually has them confined in, the, in a jail cell on the ship. So to, to protect him and also so he could speak. So that's the kind of respect that he had. So, uh, and he does, he, he goes to England, um, and at that time he's, he's, uh, he meets uh, Julie Griffith, and Julie Griffith and some others, and he speaks, he's accepted everywhere, they love him. Um, but he does miss home, but meantime, who's taking care of the family? Anna. There's another sister, Harriet, uh, Bailey, and she's also lives with them in Lynn, and then later in Rochester. So Janet has some help, but meantime, she's you know keeping the family together. He does send money. The anti-slavery society is sending money, but still, she's holding everything together. Uh, and he meets the Griffin sisters, and now they say, "Listen, you know your work is so important. You should be. You know we need to we need to purchase your freedom." So, but here's the thing, with the garrison, with the garrison, the Garrisonians, they don't believe it because if you, if you buy your freedom, that's thing like your child. So they, this is something that he and uh, William Lloyd Garrison always talked about, and, uh, and, but he agrees. So the, the sisters, they pay for his freedom, 150 pounds, which is equivalent to about $750. And now, while he's in England, he is now free. They start the paperwork in November, and uh, by December it's complete. What year is this now? I want to say, um, no. Uh, That's okay. I think it's 45. I actually had it. But, uh, so it's after you wrote the book. It's, it's, it's after the book. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so what happens is he, uh, I want to say 1845. That's okay. Yeah. So, uh, so now he comes back, you know, successful tour, and um, he returns, and uh, he comes to, he comes back, they move from Lynn to Rochester, and uh, in, the, one of the Griffiths girls, Julia, returns, okay? Uh, she helps him with this money that he saved, and they, her and her sister help him set up his own newspaper, the North Star. Now, the Liberator was the main newspaper that Garrison had founded in 1831. So the North Star is, he, he doesn't, if he was here today, he would say, I didn't establish it. it was, Martin Delaney, he and Martin Delaney. If you look at the, the records for 1847 in Rochester, New York, it says Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney. So that's what I'm saying. A lot of times, history leaves out some of these other people who were helping, you know. And so uh, uh, they, he comes to Rochester, Julia helps. She serves as his uh, office, a business manager. She becomes a constant companion. She arranges his lectures, accompanies him to meetings, deals with the paper's finances. Anna is very uneasy with this. He's seen in the, in the town of Rochester, walking down, now he's married, and Julia's living at the house with his, his wife and children, and he's seen down the street walking arm in arm, you know, and, and you know, he's black, she's white, and, uh, and I think my wife would have a problem if I was, you know, walking around Brockton and, and, and holding somebody's arm regardless of it. And so if, this is what happens. It's a scandal. It's a scandal. Could we sign on top of one, please? Thank you. Um, and what happens is now Garrison, they've split, and Garrison says, listen. He says, this, this is hurting the abolitionist cause. You know, this is a scandal. You know, so Julia now leaves and she departs and she goes to uh, back to England. Um, and this is a Julia. This is his second wife. But in meantime, um, you know, he's becoming more famous. You know, his book is being translated into other languages. 
Swedish, uh, Danish, German. There's a friend, Ottilie Asning, uh, Asning, and she is uh, a young woman from Germany. She translates the book into English. Um, after Julia returns, she's infatuated with with Frederick, and she and they. It's rumored they had a, uh, an affair. Um, so we go now to 1848. Uh, we have a situation where uh, he is now in Rochester. Business is booming, and. At a speaking engagement, um, you know, 1848, 1849, at a speaking, he has a speaking engagement in Philadelphia, and at that time, um, we have a situation where John Brown conducts his raid at Hopkins Ferry. That's October 16, 1859. Now, John Brown is, this is another connection to the Liberty Tree. John, John Brown is an abolitionist, he's radical. Black abolitionists had said, Fred, you've got to meet this guy, John Brown. He lived in Springfield at the time. So Frederick Douglass and John Brown had met. They correspond. Um, he told him, this is suicide. This is not a good idea. Now, this is, Hoppers Ferry is in West Virginia, but there was no West Virginia at this time. It was all Virginia. West Virginia occurred, the break occurred afterwards. So uh, now John Brown is arrested. And what I did was, I was going through, there was no Brockton Enterprise or Brockton Times. We had, at that time, the North Bridgewater Gazette. So I, I had pulled some of the, uh, from the 1850s, the coverage of the raid on Hopkins Ferry. But what happens is, because he had corresponded with John Brown, he was in danger of being arrested. So again, and this is, this is what happens, he was at a speaking engagement in Philadelphia, and he fled to Hoboken. And Hoboken, he was, when he went to Hoboken, that is the home of um, Audley Asnick, this young German person. So that's why a lot of people feel that, you know, the rumors were more fact than rumor. But anyway, he went to Hoboken. From there, he went to, uh, to Canada, where he boarded the, remember he took the Cambria the first time he went to England. Um, this time he takes the Scotia uh, from Canada. At, he's in England. After six months, he has five kids. His youngest daughter, Annie, dies. Mm -hmm. And he returns back to Rochester. And, uh, and so here we have a situation where uh, family, the first child that, that he has lost, is, um, dies, and he's back in the States. Questions, comments, because I know I'm Zooming. Springfield, Mass. Springfield. That's where John Brown lived. And, and Rochester, Mass. Rochester, no, Rochester, New York. York. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I mentioned about Grafton. He also spoke in Hubbardston. <coughs> he, he spoke in Abington. He spoke in North Bridgewater. The reason why we, the, we don't have the North Bridgewater Gazettes for that period when he would have spoken here, they're missing. Um, and uh, so I would have to check with the Mass Historical Society in Boston and so forth. But we, we, there will come a time we will actually see he's in North Bridgewater. He, he, you know, he, because uh, this is, he was at that station. Edward Eels Bennett, uh, he uh, owned the uh, stables and a transport business coach. And he was, he was a fervent, radical abolitionist. So he was a station master. When, uh, when Douglas moves back, when he moves to uh, Rochester, he had, at one point, they had like 11 fugitive slaves living there. Uh, Harriet Tubman stayed there 19 days. Um, he met with um, uh, Sojourner Truth in, I want to say, Florence, Massachusetts. So they, they, the network, they're all communicating with each other, um, and they're very active. Uh, let's see. Now, I'm fast forwarding. This is Helen Pitts Douglas. After Anna passes away, she was sickly. Um, Frederick is uh, in Washington. 
what happens is, let me, let me go back, they're in Rochester, their house is burned down. The house was set fire. In the fire, a lot of the records to the, uh, the North Star destroyed, and letters between um, Otto, Otto Lee Asni, the young German woman, I, I wish I had a slide there, but I didn't put it up, um, uh, destroyed. So now uh, people are saying, well, rebuild. It's just like with uh, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. They, you know, the homes are destroyed, bombed, Malton cocktails, whatever. And then Frederick says, no, I'm going to move to Washington. So they, after the, the house is burned, they decide to move to Washington. And he moves to Washington. And then uh, some years pass, and Anna gets sick. She dies. He's working for the government. And one of the co-workers, the secretary, Helen um, Pitts, um, they meet, they marry. Scandal, scandal, scandal. This is, this is the 1880s, 1884, 1885. The woman, uh, Audley Asning, who he reportedly had an affair with, she's the one that translated uh, his book into German. Mm -hmm. She takes uh, cyanide, she goes to a park in New York and commits suicide. Aww. She always felt that, this is what historians say, she always felt that when Anna died, that she would be the next person. He married Helen, who was 20 years his junior. And, uh, and so that's what I'm saying. And every, and every, you know, even famous people who are good people, they still look at Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, you know. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you have to separate the hero from, and the myth from the real person. It doesn't mean that the good things they did are invalid. Uh, so now he marries Helen Pitts. Now, this creates a real skin. Um, 1880s, she's white. He's black. She's a descendant of Priscilla Alden, Mayflower, Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. uh, lived in the Mount Holyoke area. She, her father's a, a minister. It's just like, and then his family, uh, Rosetta said to him, you know, this is, you're the leader of our people. You know, what does this say about mm -hmm. our colored women folk? You know, you know, if you must marry again, why? Why her? So it creates unbelievable schisms, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but Lucretia Cop, uh, Lucretia uh, yeah. Smart, thank you. And uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, all his true friends said, you know, whatever you do, we're still with you, you know. So, she, but it does create some problems. Is she a Quaker too? Uh, yeah, well, I don't think so, because they were old uh, pilgrims, but, uh, I'm trying to think here. I, don't, I think her father was a Methodist minister. Okay. Uh, good, good, good. Other questions? So now we're in the 1880s. Um, he is, uh, people are still, now he, all, this, all these changes, he's, he's been appointed by different, all the presidents from Lincoln on in, respect him. Uh, when he was the first African American. Uh, of note invited to the White House. And when he went to see Lincoln, the governor of Connecticut, um, he was talking, uh, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln were talking, and the and, and Lincoln's secretary said, excuse me, uh, President Lincoln, the governor of Connecticut is, uh, yeah, next to the point, he's waiting to see you. He said, you tell him I'm talking with Frederick Douglass, he'll have to wait. You know? <laughs> so, uh, then they, they became friends. They didn't always agree, but they became friends. So the 54th and 55th established here, his two sons, as you saw, they enrolled. All uh, African-American uh, uh, men who were eligible from other states could join the 54th and the 55th. That's the movie Glory. Mm -hmm. So they, they, could, they could join if they wanted to, so that's why Lewis and Charles um, joined. Uh, now we have a situation where Lincoln is assassinated, and at the assassination, after the assassination, he's invited to the funeral. As he approaches, uh, an officer blocks him. Oh no, this is before the funeral. There was another uh, event, and he, he was invited to see the president, and he was 
going to see him and the officer blocked him and and Abraham Lincoln was able to see said, oh excuse me they, does that mic excuse me let him in that that's the that was that also happened so that was the second so he met uh, Lincoln at least two occasions when he died uh, they the body uh, lied in state and there were places I want to say New York Washington and African Americans were not allowed to express their condolences at, at certain places that no color were allowed. Mrs. Lincoln um, actually sent uh, Frederick Douglass President Lincoln's walking stick, which is the last last time I was at Anacosta in Washington, I was still there. So you know she sent the you know and, and she knew they were friends. So now we have a situation. Um, and we have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. There's still turmoil, um, and he is still the leader. He's trying to get people to come together. One of the things he did, which most uh, historians think uh, hurt him, the, the free blacks in the South, we call them exodusters, those who wanted to move to Kansas and other places. Frederick Douglass felt they should stay in the South to help rebuild the South. And, uh, and basically, I think he couldn't see the idea that they're free, and that choice really should be theirs. So that kind of uh, Next slide. Uh, this is uh, a young lady, Miss <coughs> Kelly, who was an abolitionist. Uh, Abby Kelly Foster, she was an abolitionist. And in the early days when they went, to speak at different arrangements, he and Mr. Collins, and then and then she would also assist. She was from the land area. Next one, uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, who I mentioned was with him for uh, uh, stayed at his house uh, approximately 19 days. Uh, they were both from the same county in Maryland, so they were both runaway slaves from Maryland, Eastern Shore. Next one, Sojourner True. And again, she uh, uh, met with Frederick and others in Florence, Massachusetts, and, uh, and they dealt, uh, she was part of the Underground Railroad. Next one. William Lloyd Garrison, it, who actually spoke in North Bridgewater, which was brought in several times. Next one. Uh, this is, um, come to me, come to me. He, uh, there are two people that were Wigler Garrison and he also spoke here in North Bridgewater. Wendell Phillips, he was the uh, ancestor of the first mayor of uh, Boston and a radical abolitionist lived in uh, Beacon Hill and also spoke with uh, President Douglas. Next one. Uh, Susan, anybody? Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony, very good. Yeah, Again, one of the things that in 1851 he had spoken at a conference in Worcester, and he had mentioned that, that the rights in terms of women were so important, and that um, and he spoke eloquently. So he always was against he was against what happened to uh, against discrimination against the Native American. One of the things that people don't realize is it the term. If you're born here, you're an American. That, that's from the abolitionist movement. They're the first group that said, if you're born here, you are an American. You have a birthright. And it comes up again with the immigration, with the doctor, and so forth. Next one. Anybody? Lucretia Mott. Yeah, Lucretia Mott. Uh, again, and so this is the 1848, this is the, uh, there's a big anniversary in terms of Seneca Falls. But the, he, the, the, the reason why he was one of the few men that supported women's rights. So they used to call them Hephrodites, you know, men who supported women's rights. They said, you, you know, you have, something's wrong with you when God gave you birth. So you've got some women. And so he was, you know, ridiculed and so forth. But he always stood up, he and a few others. But they, even when he died, they all, those who were still alive, they spoke at his funeral in 1895 saying he always was uh, steadfast. Now the reason why they fell apart, he said we can't have women's rights and freedom for the, for the slave at the same time. He says you have to have separate male suffrage, then female suffrage. And they disagreed, but later on they saw the wisdom. Next one. 
Um, this woman was a very, very powerful woman, Miss, Mrs. Chapman. She was secretary to the uh, Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. A lot of people thought Wade Boyd Garrison was in charge and he was in control. He, uh, she really ran the, the, the business. And so, but most people don't realize. Next one. This is his house in um, Anacosta. It's now a national site museum. Beautiful. They maintained everything. You can, the library, the study, the furniture, the walking stick. Next one. Still, uh, that still you, there. Still there. Beautiful. It's National Park Service. The grounds are um, just well cut. This is his study. Uh, I think this was taken uh, about a year before he passed. Next one. No. Sure. That's it. Okay, can I have the lights, please? How are we doing for time? Good. Now, um, what what I what I want uh, to do is uh, I mentioned this exhibit is uh, really the brainchild and work of uh, Lynn Lynn Smith Lynn. Thank you. bring scholars, former students I had from Brockton High, from Cotton Spellman, they did research. And so it, it just shows you, because I, you know, I was moving so fast, I didn't talk about his connections in Ireland and the Cape Verde community in New Bedford or the Haitian community he was representative to Haiti. Um, and I did mention in terms of women's rights. Uh, but we have also this quilt and so what happens is uh, the quilt project was done, but quilts were the, the first group that came against slavery, first major white group, was the, they were the Quakers in 1688. And so it is true that a lot of connections on the Underground Railroad, a lot of those were Quaker people, and they, they uh, used to make quilts for the slaves, knit things, and so the runaway slaves, as they're moving further north from the south, they would give them clothes. And that's what Edward Neal's Bennett did here. So the station here, there was another station at the corner of, uh, of Belmont Street in Maine. Um, and then there was the one on High Street, which is now Frederick Douglass Avenue. There was another one on Pearl Street. There was some in Newton. So all these stations would help as the slaves uh, went north. And there were two major routes that they could take. One led them toward Halifax, another led them toward Ontario. So it was, you know, a lot of people, they, they, once they settled some places, they said, well, I, can, I feel safe here. I don't need to go to Canada. So that's why you see Halifax still has that large black community in Canada. That dates back to the uh, pre-slavery days. But um, the quilt is a project that was done. I don't know, you want to mention a little bit about it? In fact, uh, Jill Wiley, her church, once the Liberty Tree was cut down, they, the church community felt something was missing. So they took it upon themselves to create this quilt and they asked members of the community to come in and do a leaf. She has brought uh, binders that give a description of the leaves people have made and a little story about their feelings. So, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so there's a book here that will tell who made which leaf and the story behind their ancestors of uh, what the leaf means to them, symbolizing their trip to freedom. Or, uh, so it's hung in many churches, and we feel it makes a great home here. I mean, before I finish, I wanted to, one of the things that really, uh, my first grade teacher was uh, Jean Ionieri at the Spring School here in Brockton. And about the same age that I was experiencing the joy of learning and reading and coloring with my first grade teacher, at the same age, Frederick Douglass was, was actually fighting to survive because one of the things they, they, when he was a child, when you're little, you don't go and work in the fields. You stay at a certain place and you do, um, you take care of the, the chickens and things like that. And one of the descriptions when you, when you read the book is the little boys and little girls eating food 
out of a, a trap, oh, like a pig. So like, in what, there are no spoons, so he remembers using either a seashell, like a scallop shell, or a piece of shingle to eat. And then, you know, and one of the things that he points out is that it's, it, you know, to have some slave owners make sure their slaves were well fed, and the mean ones did not. And he said that it was always a struggle. And also, you didn't have shoes, no shoes, so you went barefoot. And you only had one pair of uh, trousers. And, I mean, you know, so you read that. And I remember when, in high school, and I said, wow, it's just, just the, 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 the sheer uh, pain of that, you know. And when you think of, you know, like an animal, you know. So that's why he, the, the fact that he was able to overcome that and then also to rise to the level that he did. Um, is really, really something. But I do want to leave you, there's so many quotes. Um, there are two things that I want to talk about too uh, before I finish. Um, to heal the scourge of prejudice, the life and writings of Jose Easton. Um, he was a, an African American who lived here in North Bridgewater. He, his parents were free, they came from Newport. He lived in uh, on the Brockton Avon line here uh, where Fields Park is today. And uh, he has still descendants in the, in the city. Edward Eels Bennett still has descendants in the city. And so this free family actually, you know, because you know, we have slaves who were free in North Bridgewater. Slavery was abolished in 1780 here. But what happened is a lot of the slaves, they had first names, so it was hard to track. But we do have free families of color that were in the, who actually saw all these changes, who were probably at some of the meetings that uh, Frederick Douglass and Amelia Boomer and others had attended. So it's just a rich history. Rich history. But uh, before you leave, I do want you to take a look. There's a beautiful portrait of uh, Edward Niels Bennett. And then what happened, the tree, which actually mirrors Brockton's development, because the tree was planted in 1763, uh, when we were still uh, North Precinct. And in uh, 1764, uh, I think with the population, if I have it, was about uh, 800 in uh, the North Precinct, of, of which is, was North Bridgewater. So not, it was later North Parish. This whole area, so that, you know, there were, I always, we never knew there were some families that were free and free during Frederick Benton's time even before. And, that, and so that's an interesting piece of research. But uh, thank you very much. You've been a good audience.